All right, my name is Captain Irving, and you're in F Troop. Now, oh, kitty. O'Rourke Enterprises has a new venture, selling gold claims. Except there's no gold around these parts. $75 worth. <laughs> oh, what an investment. <laughs> Okay, now there is. That's called salting the hill. It could get you in big trouble with the law if you got caught. It could get you in bigger trouble with the people you swindled if they got to you before the law did. While they head back to the fork to round up some pigeons, I mean investors, someone else has other ideas. Running bull? Yes, Professor. Better fetch my prospecting shovel. That's Professor Cornelius Clyde. It's not hard to figure out what he's going to do. Back at the fort, O'Rourke goes to work on Captain Parmenter. Uh, Dobbs? Dobbs? Dobbs! You don't like it, huh? Well, I do, I do. It's, it's very pretty, but there just isn't anything in the regulations about a bugler playing the violin. He plays it at least as well as he plays his bugle, but for one thing, a violin isn't loud enough. Try again. O'Rourke comes in and somehow lets it slip that gold has been discovered at that particular place. Next thing we know, all the men are out there digging for the next big strike. Except nobody has gone near the spot where O'Rourke actually planted the gold. Pulling off a gag like that requires a special look and demeanor. Ken Berry had it, and he could work it to the max. You really believe that's something Wilton Parmenter would do. You all right, Captain? I'm fine, I'm fine. Whew. Prospecting for gold is pretty tough work, isn't it? Well, it doesn't grow on trees, sir, that's for sure. Why don't you look someplace else, like over there? Fewer trees over that way, so it's safer. They get in digging in the right place and make the big discovery. Must be $75 worth. Yeah, sure, I don't see any gold. There it is, Captain, right? Sarge, what? There ain't no gold. Well, that was a pointless trip. The troops head back to town. Sergeant, do you have a feeling there's something missing? Yeah, people. Conveniently, Jane is still in town, but not for long. Where is everybody? <laughs> Duration of what? The gold strike, ain't you heard? Gold strike? What are you talking about? We just come from Calico Mountain. Ain't nobody there. This one's up north of Laramie. Everybody bought a claim and hightailed it out of here. Bought a claim from whom? I tell you what I'm gonna do for my friends in the service. It's with each and every parcel of land backed with my personal guarantee to contain 14 carat solid gold, I will include three bottles of the world's greatest tonic, Running Bull's Magic Elixir. He's a snake oil salesman who just stumbled into a much more lucrative venture. And he doesn't even have to buy bottles to put it in. For the first 19 years of his life, before he invented this titan among tonics, Chief Running Bull was known as Tired Heifer, the last of the Pazzos. And look at him now. Pretty well preserved for 122 years old, according to the professor that tonic has kept him looking like this for the last 103 years. If his tonic is so great, I want him to explain why he's the last of his tribe. Did he refuse to share? You give that money back to the men and hightail it out of here, or I'm gonna throw you and that mousy Methuselah in the guardhouse. We'll toss you both in the clink and throw the key away. The clink. I hope it's big enough for all four of us. What's that supposed to mean? Gentlemen, I have here in this little sack about $75 worth of small gold nuggets. So what? He can't prove where they came from, so it would be his word against theirs. I wonder which one Captain Parmenter would be more inclined to believe. But they won't think of that. He's got them over a barrel. Still, he sold all his deeds, so it's time to pack up and go anyway. There goes his evidence, but they won't make that connection. Instead, Agarn will find that pile of nuggets, and soon everybody in the fort is digging up the parade ground. <laughs> Wouldn't it be easier if you just tried to do better on your bugle? The banjo's much louder than the violin. 
Besides, I practice so much on that bugle, my pucker's beginning to say. Okay, first a bad violin and now a bad banjo. I'm starting to think his goal is to chase the men away. I want you and Corporal Agarn to go after Professor Clyde and bring him back here immediately. Clyde? But why would you want to do that, sir? Well, the man's a crook. He fleeced practically everybody in Fort Courage. Oh, no, that's a very strong accusation, sir. I mean, are you quite sure? Which, of course I'm sure. You know where those claims are? I looked it up on the map, and the men of F Troop now own Old Faithful Geyser in Yellowstone Park. Wow. President Grant only created the park four years ago, and already they have to sell it off. So sad. That's United States government property. It never belonged to the Pazzos. And you know why? Because I found out there never was any such tribe as the Pazzos. Not one single Potts. However, the word did give Samuel Beckett an idea for a character name some 70 years later. Unfortunately, the playwright refused to give Professor Clyde proper credit for the reference. The professor's descendants sued and lost. O'Rourke doesn't want to catch the professor because it means his and Agarn's necks as well. So they'll spend a couple of days at the Hakawi camp and then tell the captain they couldn't find Clyde. Besides, they need to tell Wild Eagle to scale back whiskey production since nobody's in town to drink it at the moment. Hey, Chief, I am trying to talk to you. Will you stop with the dance? Wild Eagle not dance? Football asleep? Bad circulation. Hey, I just felt some rain. How you like that? Maybe that was dance I do. This time I try for snow. O'Rourke tells him the situation and says, I want you to cut down on the whiskey. Cut down? We already cut out. A cow I got much better use for still. Make magic elixir. <laughs> While Digger lived to be 143 years old. We caught up with him. Yep, he got there first. Wild Eagle refuses to believe Clyde is a con man, but O'Rourke doesn't care. All right, Clyde, you got one more chance. Now you take Junior there and pull freight for the Tulis, or I'm going to turn you over to the captain. He knows all about you. Oh, goody, then all we have to do is tell him about you. Ask to see his bag of nuggets again. That should be revealing. No. Really? You stop! Look at me! Hang on to him, Wild Eagle. Don't forget, red blood thicker than white blood. I'll take care of him, Sarge! Jane rushes back to the fort and reports that the Hakawis have captured O'Rourke and Agarn. That's a violation of the peace treaty, so this calls for war. Captain Parmeter tells Dobbs to blow assembly. I was right, he is trying to drive all the men to desertion, or at least depression. That's Private Vanderbilt. He's basically blind. He's also the lookout who's usually up in the tower when they knock it down. That part can be a little overdone, but all in all, he's a good, funny character. Just don't ask him to watch your back, because there's a good chance he'll say, Sure! Where is it? Found up! We have to go save Corporal Agar and Sergeant O'Rourke from those bloodthirsty Hikawas! <laughs> Ken Berry had one other big advantage when he took this role, and you could see it right there. Watch it again, but keep your eyes on his feet. Found up! We have to go save Corporal Agar and Sergeant O'Rourke from those bloodthirsty Hikawas! <laughs> on top of everything else, Ken Berry was an accomplished dancer, and dancing was partly how he got his start. You can see that training in every stumble he does, because, I can't think of a better word for it, he's just graceful at stumbling and falling. Even when he's doing something like that, you can see that he has complete control over every part of his body. That's part of what makes his pratfalls in this series so funny, because he's able to do some super elaborate moves that keep you wondering for several seconds, instead of just falling on his prat. Now spread out, and when we complete the circle, we'll have the signal for the attack. Uh... Someone will make a noise like an owl. Who? That's very good, Dobbs. Thank you for volunteering. This show had a magic, just like Hogan's Heroes did. If you've seen my reviews of Hogan's Heroes, you might remember me talking about the way that show had a certain something that is indefinable, but it makes these old jokes work. We're seeing it again here. Incidentally, if I may digress for a moment, 
If you haven't seen my reviews of Hogan's Heroes, you can thank a certain TV network whose name starts with something you do with your eyes, C, and ends with male bovine excrement, BS. A few years ago, they hassled me and threatened legal action until I finally took the whole mess down and migrated it to daily motion. There's a link below if you want to check it out. I covered the first three seasons, and if those reviews catch on better over there, I might think about doing the rest of the series. But right now, we have soldiers to rescue. Dobbs, I ain't ready yet. Me neither. I didn't give a hoot. <laughs> Charge! What Vanderbilt lacks in eyesight, he makes up for in enthusiasm. Vanderbilt, come here. Take your glasses off. Agarn should learn to recognize that and be a little more positive in his evaluation of Vanderbilt. He should also keep his hat to himself. Turns out it was all a big misunderstanding. Nobody broke the peace treaty. But what about the professor? Jane said she saw him here. What happened to him? Greetings. Greetings, oh brothers. Who he? Thunderbird. Chief of all tamarisks. He says, you look him for professor, him long gone. We have him big fight, him wiggle away and leave. Him gone for good. John Daner was one of the best known character actors in Hollywood all through the Western era and beyond. I first saw him in a sitcom back in the 70s called Temperatures Rising. But if you want to look it up on IMDb, don't look for Temperatures Rising. Look for the new Temperatures Rising because after the first season, they changed the name, revamped several characters, and otherwise admitted they didn't do the first season right. He showed up in the second season as a stodgy, ultra-conservative, brown-nosing doctor who was always angling for a way to get himself more noticed. He could play just about any type of character from the seasoned lawman and gunslinger to the pompous snake oil salesman who goes native to avoid getting in trouble. And Chief Thunderbird is a much nicer person. Just look what he did for the troops. He, uh, he got back all the money. Watch him, friend. <laughs> you are, Captain. The good chief got back every cent. Chief Thunderbird no say him nothing cause no want him to reveal true identity, yum. Men, let's have three cheers for Chief Thunderbird. Honest in. I remember using that expression as a child. It was one way of saying I'm telling the truth. I never figured out why or what it was supposed to indicate about Indians. It seems to me like a bad expression. What are you doing? Nobody asked you to dance. Who dance? Moccasin too tight. Football asleep again. <laughs> oh, no. How you like that? Wild Eagle first engine ever do snow dance. If he can figure out what he did, he can make a fortune of his own giving lessons. Gold! Big gold star can shine! <laughs> this darn beagle's gonna get me killed yet. Dobbs, when are you gonna stop getting people all head up about these fake gold strikes? Oh, this ain't no fake, Sergeant. The gold was discovered by Thunderbird, and you yourself said he's an honest engine. I told you it was a bad expression. If you're enjoying this, be sure to click the thumbs up button to show you like it. If you're not subscribed yet, punch me in the face right here and get it done. And don't forget that you can become a patron and help keep this kitty fed. The link is below. Until next time.